This, this is, is Space, Space Dream. Dream. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is a blessed day this morning. How I want to greet you all that are on our online audience on Facebook, those who will tune in at a later date and time on YouTube, and you all that are here live in the sanctuary. This is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It is such an honor and a privilege for you to join me in this space and in this place. Man, we have a great Sunday school lesson this morning and I can't wait to dive deep into it. I want to instruct those that are online, that are watching, to please leave your comments on the, uh, in the comment section, okay? If you have any questions, any comments, any concerns, please leave it in the comment section so we can answer those questions that you may have right here, right now. Amen, amen. But before we do anything, what we like to do is go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we come this morning thanking you, Father, for another day. It's another day's journey, Lord, and we are glad. We are glad about it because it's another day that is filled with your grace and your mercy, Lord. Despite what we did yesterday, despite what we did last week, despite what we did just an hour ago, Lord, there is grace and there is mercy for that, Lord, that we say thank you, Lord. Today is in this lesson, Lord, we ask that you touch our hearts and our minds, Lord. Let us be transformed, Lord. Let us have a heart transplant, Lord to get us, Lord, to be more and more every single day like your son, Jesus the Christ, Lord. For which we understand, Lord, that we love you, Lord, in the same fa fashion that we should love our neighbors, Lord, which is indicative of how we love ourselves, Lord. So, Lord, help us today just to love all around, Lord. And in the master's name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. We are having a great lesson this morning. John, the fourth chapter, verses 46 through 54. If those who did not watch on last week and those that are in the sanctuary today, if you remember that the book is a guide for us. But when you're teaching, when you're facilitating, when you're instructing, then you are the instructor in which you should be able to cross-level scriptures, uh, be able to provide more information than what the book provides. Amen? So what we do here now at Sunday School is that we have the book as a guide. But as your facilitator, I will not stay directly in the book from point to point. Amen? Just want to let you know that. But also understand that even those that are in the sanctuary, and as I stated earlier, those that are watching live online, if there are any questions, comments, or concerns, you can put it in the comment section, and we will get to that. Amen? The word healed. The word heals. That's today's lesson, John, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse number 46. And it reads, once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Uh, and this is Jesus speaking right here, verse number 46. Uh, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. I want you to hold on to that part right there, okay? The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Hold on to that right there, too. While he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son 
will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. I want to pose a question this morning. Uh, if this was a sermon, we call it a sermonic survey. But I just want to pose a question this morning. When you hear the title, the word heals, what comes to mind? What comes to mind, Deacon Blakey? When you hear the title, the word heals. Knowing what you already know, what the word is. Now, we talked about it last week, remember? So what do you, what, 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 what do you hear now when you read this title, The Word Heals? It's okay, it's okay. There you go. We say Jesus, Jesus heals. Do you agree with that, Sister Bobby? Amen, amen, because we learned last week that John wrote this book, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the brother of James, and they were called what? The sons of thunder. It's John who wrote this, uh, who, who witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus. Remember when Moses and Elijah up on the Mount of Transfiguration? It was John that was up there. It was John along with Peter who was entrusted in preparing the Lord's Supper. We learned last week that it was John who was with Jesus in private prayer in the garden. It was John who's the only disciple who died a natural death. And we learned that John... Is, is, is writing this gospel for what reason? What, what was the reason that John is writing this gospel? Y'all remember John 20, verses number 30 and 31. Because remember, John, we call them miracles. But John calls them signs. So what, what is the purpose of a sign? What is the purpose of a sign? My online audience, go ahead, type in the comment section. What is the purpose of a sign? You're driving down the street, and you see a stop sign. What's the purpose of that stop sign? Direction. Another word is guidance. Information. So if, you, if, you, if you're driving down the street, and, and you see a railroad crossing sign, what is that informing you? Caution, what else? There's a train track. There's a track right there. Right. So signs are there. John has these signs. Yes, Sister Claypool, it's direction. That is the purpose of signs. And that's where John says it like this. He says that I am giving you these signs that Jesus did. Don't, don't, don't miss it. John, the 20th chapter, verses 30 and 31, he says, I'm giving you these signs of Jesus so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole purpose of John, writing this. That's, that's the whole purpose of John, writing this, to give us the signs that Jesus is the Son of God. So there's no doubt there is no confusion that Jesus is the son. That's why John is writing this. So, so, so with that in mind, well, it, it's very important now to understand, because we got to understand the context. We call that, what would we call, oh, I, I taught y'all a, 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 I can't even think of the name what it's called. But what we learned in seminary called the GCCs, the genre, content, and context. That every teacher, every facilitator, every instructor, every preacher should be able to give you the GCCs, the genre, the content, and the context. If, if they have not done that, then maybe you, you, you got to like, okay, need you to, you know, tighten up on your ability to teach. Okay? So, so now we have the context. Why John is writing this? John is writing this so that we 
even the readers of that day and time may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So that tells you right there that it's probably some people in this day and age when John wrote this that did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. So John is right, and even today, right now, you even have some people in the church who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You got some people who don't even believe in God, period, at all. They come to church every doggone Sunday. Every doggone Sunday in the building. Now, we don't shun them. We don't put them out. The power, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, that's God's business right there. Okay? All I'm doing is instructed to keep on preaching and teaching. Because we learn Jesus in the parable of the sower that some seeds fall on good ground, some fall on the thorns, some fall every which way. So that's not my job to call them out. It's my job is to keep preaching and teaching to uh, them. So we understand now why John wrote this is to show us that Jesus is the Messiah because somebody is not believing. So understanding that, we at a point now where John, uh, he gives us the story of the first of the only three healing stories that he gives us. There's only three healing stories in the Gospel of John. Y'all remember what they are? Anybody online know the three healing stories in John? Here's one right here. So you, this is given. What are the other two? What are the other two healing stories? Yep, that's one. Good. Yes, Sister Bobby. Yes, that's one. So now we got two. So we got the royal official son. And for those that online that didn't hear her, we have the man at the pool of Bethesda. What is the other one? What is the other one? You'll find it in John, the ninth chapter. John, the ninth chapter. The blind man. The blind man. Yeah. the blind man. These are the only three healing stories that John has given us in his whole gospel. The royal official son, the man at the pool of Bethesda, and the blind man. Okay? Now, now, it's, it's very important that when you read this, it says that Jesus is now what? Coming upon Cana in Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal fisher whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Capernaum. Why is John giving us all these cities and regions and geographical locations. Why do you think John is doing that? Why is it so important for John to, 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 to give us Cana of Galilee where he turned water into wine? There you go. That's right. That's right. Those that didn't hear it online, it's just his ministerial journey, his ministry journey. And you got to understand that John is, is focused on the signs, right? He's presenting us with the signs. So, so geography is theology in John. And, and what's happening is Jesus is, is doing what we call a Cana to Cana cycle. It's completing something. Because you got to remember that Jesus begins by working on behalf of the Jewish people at what? What did he do first? At Canaan. What did he do first at Canaan? He turned water into wine. That was the first thing he'd ever done, his first miracle. Then what he does is he, he expands his scope of practice. And he embraces the Samaritans. And then he concludes by including even Gentiles. So Jesus does this amongst his own people. 
Then he goes out and do some stuff for other people, and then he comes back to Canaan. Okay? He, 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 John intentionally reminds the reader of the early sign done in Canaan. He, he, he has to let you know that this is the place where he turned water into wine. He has to let you know. And then John says, then he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had changed the water to wine. Secondly, John connects the language of believing. Since Jesus did this, beginning of the signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory. And his dis disciples believed in him. Once again, it's about the signs. John is focused on the signs of Jesus. He's focused on the things, the miracles, what we will call miracles. John is calling them signs. <coughs> that is what he is focused on. So he's connecting the language that Jesus did this beginning of the signs in Cana of Galilee that revealed his glory, that did what? Caused his disciples to believe in him. Now, disciples is just anyone who's following him. you got to understand there's more than 12 disciples. There's more than 12 disciples. So Jesus is doing these signs so his disciples can believe in him. So what is it that he's trying to get them to believe? That he is what? He's the Messiah. So by doing this, he got the disciples to believe that he is the Son of God. But remember, I told you all to hold on to that, right? Hold on. When we was reading that here, I told y'all to hold on to it. But number three, in each story, in this story, in the man at the pool of Bethesda, and at the man that was born blind, the person makes a request from Jesus, and you notice what Jesus does. Has anyone ever noticed what Jesus, when this person comes and makes a request of Jesus, what do Jesus do? What do you think Jesus do? This man just told Jesus, hey, I need for you. My son is sick. I need for you to come down and heal him. And what does Jesus do? Hmm? Told him to go home. But Jesus didn't act immediately. In all three of these healing stories, Jesus does not act immediately. He actually pushes back with a rebuke. But guess what? Each person persists, and then Jesus delivers. Now, now think about that. Think, think about that for a moment. What is that teaching us today? That just because Jesus does not answer our prayers immediately does not mean that we give up. That we keep on pushing, we keep on knocking, we keep on asking until we get a response from him. We have to wait until we get it. Now, now here's the thing. Don't get it confused now, okay? Because a response may not be the answer that you're seeking. Please do not get that confused. The answer that you, what you're asking for, you may not get, but you will get a response. And sometimes... The response that you do get is better than what you was asking for in the first place. Sometimes it's better. But don't get caught up in saying, being specific, Lord, I need for you to do this, and then get mad because he don't do that. This man wanted Jesus to come to his house. Now, I want you to think about it. I, I want somebody online to, to, to type in the comment section is what if Jesus had stopped what he was doing and went to this man's house with him? Now, we, we know through studying that this is a 12-hour journey, almost a 12-hour journey. So Jesus now got to go 12 hours in this direction with this man. What would have happened? Now, now, think of the situation. Oh, I got, I got to make y'all dig deep this morning. 
Now, his son is lay dying. He's dying unto death, sick unto death. He is dying. What if Jesus had to say, okay, let me come on to the house with you? Don't y'all think the son would have died? The son would have died. The son probably was not going to live another 12 hours. So if Jesus had stopped doing what he was doing, then, and went with this man, then the son would have died. Because Jesus wouldn't have gotten to the house in time. Sometimes we got to take what we get from him. It may not be in the direction we wanted to go in. It may not be packaged the way that we want it to be packaged in. But we got to take what he provides us with. Trust me, I went through that so many times in my life. Well, I wanted a certain job and a certain position. I, I, I interviewed for a uh, COO position once because I'm, I'm, I, uh, I do... Uh, uh, operations in the military, healthcare operations, and it was this veteran clinic that I was applying for, and I applied for the COO position, chief operations officer. I knew I could do the job. Had an interview with the uh, CEO. She was a retired general from the Air Force. Had an interview. Thought I did good. <laughs> About two weeks later, I, uh, I emailed and I said, this is, you know, Courtney Warren just checking in to see what the status was or how you moved on with another candidate and thank you for your time. You know, all the polite things that you do, right? And this lady, this CEO, this retired one-star general from the Air Force, she emailed me back. And she said, thank you for applying for our COO position. Now, this COO position paid some good money. Pay some real good money. I was like, ooh, all my debt is canceled. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. You know. She says, I have decided to go in another direction. I've decided to pick somebody else as my COO. Then she put in a semicolon, however, comma, there is a healthcare position that I need filled. And because you have healthcare experience, I think you will be a great fit for this position. See, the, the blessing didn't come how I wanted it to be. I wanted the COO position. But that healthcare navigator position was the best position that I ever had. I was able to fly underneath the radar. I was able to come and go as I pleased. I didn't have much meetings to go to. I had autonomy over how because it was a brand new position. So I set the stage for how that position now runs. I started everything. I built that program from the ground up from the VA. But think about it. If I was COO, had all this money, I would have got caught up in what I wanted. I know myself. Maybe I never would have applied to be the pastor here at State Street. Because my mind would have been too focused on that position. I was in meetings all the time. Late at night, early mornings, on the weekends, things like that. Having four young children, that would have been hard on us as a family. So when you think about it, yes, I wanted the position. This man wanted Jesus to go to his house with him. But Jesus declined. Sometimes he does not give us what we want, but he'll give us what we need. That man needed a word in his life. He didn't need Jesus to go back to his house. He thought he needed Jesus. He, he, he put Jesus in a box. They said, Lord, the only way that my son can heal is if you yourself come down to my house. But Jesus is showing him, no, I don't have to physically be there for me to work my magic, for me to work my miracle, for me to heal. Yo, I don't have to be. Sometimes we have to stop. Y'all hear this in this morning's sermon? You don't 
have to, you don't find God only in the church. He's everywhere. You can meet Jesus anywhere. You don't have to be on a Sunday morning and sitting on a pew for you to meet God, for him to talk to you, for him to touch you, for him to heal you, for him to set you free. You can meet God on your job. You can meet God in some mess. You can meet God at the club. You can meet God with some drugs in your pocket. You can meet Jesus uh, with a bottle in your hand. You don't have to be in church to get God to work. And that's what he is showing, telling this man right here. So, so that's where Jesus uh, 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 he says, uh, 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 um, no, I'm not going to do this, but I am going to do that. Or I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do this. But we have to be persistent. In our, we just have to keep on. Cannot give up. But then, but then the, 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 the fourth thing that John is showing us is that the stories are connected by the town of Capernaum. And then John, he gives us the details. He says it like this. He says, now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. Capernaum continues to be important in John. It is the, on the way to Capernaum that Jesus walks on water. It's on their way to the same town that Jesus walks on water. Remember, geography is theology to John. He's going to give you details of where Jesus is at. This is where Jesus reveals himself to the disciples in the boat. He reveals to them that he has power over the natural world and the ability to show up during times of rough roaring to bring peace, the kind only that he can give. Have you ever had a difficult season in your life? You ever had a difficult season in your life? As a Christian, we all do. We all, if you haven't, you will one day. And Jesus shows up and he gives peace. That's the best type of peace that you can ever have. It's the peace from the Lord. I know we try to find our own peace. We try to find our own peace in drugs and alcohol and women and men and, and, and what we call in, this, in the world of therapy, self-soothing in a negative way. We, we try to find those things to bring us peace, but that's only temporary peace. But if you have Jesus in your life, then that's the peace that will, that's everlasting to everlasting. And it's on the way to Capernaum that Jesus does this. And when we look at the context in this chapter of John, it, once again, it, it starts with two chapters earlier. Back in Cana when Jesus does the first sign because the disciples believed in him. So Jesus gets back to his own neck of the woods, as we call it. Jesus is now back in Cana, and the people are welcoming him. But Jesus presents the welcome with suspicion, verse number 44. Somebody read verse number 44 for me. Verse number 44. Verse number 44. He has no honor in his own hometown. Why? Why do you think that is so? Why he don't have honor in his own? You got to remember the way Jesus is speaking to us. How, how John is speaking. Why is there no honor in his own hometown? Hmm? They didn't know him. That's one. Be, be, because, he, yeah, because John now tells us why. John says because the welcome is based on the miracles. For they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem. So they were counting on what they have seen Jesus had done, not because of who Jesus was. That's why you got to be careful sometimes 
when, when looking for signs and, 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 and uh, uh, people acting out that they say, if, if they're always, you know, having these, what I like to call them, uh, holy words, and you ask them, you know, how you doing today? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. But what it should be is basically not saying that you're not blessed, not saying that you're not favored by God, but show us how blessed you are. Show us the favor of God on your life. Do some act of kindness to somebody. Give somebody some words of encouragement. Give somebody some support. Stop, just Jesus said it. You worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So, so that's the thing right there is that they saw what Jesus had did. And Jesus is trying to get us not to just go off of what we see, but to get us to what we know in our hearts. So John presents this because the welcome is based on the signs and the miracles that Jesus had done. So, so John is clearly calling us and his readers of the day to examine your belief. Why do you believe in Jesus? I, I want to ask a question. I want you to put that in the comment section, those that are watching. Why do you believe in Jesus? I'm going to go around the sanctuary now. Why do you believe in Jesus, Deacon Blakey? Clean your soul. Why do you believe in Jesus? Deacon, Jack. Mm -hmm. Sister. Mm -hmm. Sister Bobby, why do you believe in Jesus? Because he saved you. Because he saved you. Now, guess what? None of us was outside those city gates that Friday evening when they put him on the cross. None of us was. So ask yourself this, how do you know that he died for you? You didn't see it. So how do you know he died for you? I, I think y'all know the answer, y'all scared. How do you know he died for you? Somebody said because of what he completed on Calvary's cross. Okay, good, good answer. There you go. He's trying to move us from Seeing to just believe it. That's called what? Faith. There you go, DJ. It's called faith. These people welcome Jesus because of what they have saw him do. But Jesus wants you to accept him based off of faith. And we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So many times we get caught up on what we can see. And that's what drives us to do things. But if we just have the faith and believe and have the hope even without seeing, so is there something here at State Street that we want to do? We got to have the faith that we can do it without seeing it. Because if we saw it, then there's no reason to have faith. Can you believe God even when you don't see it? So, 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 the thing about it is, and this is, this is really, really important right here. What happens if you are working off of sight and not faith? What happens when Jesus' work reveals the opposite? What happens then? You want to see him do X, Y, and Z, but he does A, B, C. Now what you do? You, you've, been, you've been praying that he heals your grandmother, your auntie, your mother, your father. They, they laying in the hospital bed right now. You're saying, Jesus, heal them. But you don't see them get out that hospital bed. 
Next thing, you find yourself at the funeral home making arrangements. What do you do then? There you go. That's faith. That's faith right there. Because the complete opposite of what you wanted took place. The complete opposite. You wanted that person to get out of that hospital bed, put on their shoes, put on their socks, put on their clothes, and walk out that front door. But they didn't. That's what you were relying on. What you saw, what you was looking for in. And God wants you to just have faith in him. He don't have to show you a sign that he is good by doing these things that we want him to do. We, tr we, we, try, to, we try to manipulate God. Lord, if you do this for me, I promise I won't do that anymore. If you do this for me, and God wants us to do the complete opposite, don't do that anymore, period. Point blank and believe that I am good. That's what he wants us to do. So, what Jesus is doing right here, he is transitioning us from faith that must be grounded in the ear and not the eye. So that's why he says, John says, this royal official, this king's man from Capernaum, was probably not at the Passover festival. So he don't know about the water into wine situation. Why? Because, I mean, he was on Herod's payroll. He's an official. He was Herodian, and he was not known to go to these type of events. So he probably didn't know anything about what Jesus had done previously. But one thing he knows is that his son is laying sick unto death. So this man gets up, gets a report from the people who had been at the wedding and had seen Jesus turned water into wine. So this man is operating off of what sight? He's operating off of what he has seen or what other people have seen. So he's going off of that. I mean, think about it. Somebody come to you and tell you that, you know, we was at this party and uh, we ran out of wine. And this man, whom we don't even know, this man, now we, we, we at this party, we at this wedding, everything is going great, it's awesome, and we run out of wine. And this man go tells the servant, his, some lady went and talked to him, I think she was his mother. And she goes to him and says, hey, we ran out of wine. Now there was a conversation between the two, and he kind of shrugged his shoulder, and I think I heard him say, what they got to do with me? This ain't my wedding. This ain't my problem. That's the groom's problem. Shoot, I'm just here to kick it like the rest of y'all. So it was a little tussle back and forth of conversation, but then the mom said, you know what? Forget you. Not like that. But she goes to the servants and tell the servants, hey, he's going to give you some directions to do something. Make sure you follow it. So the servants go, and Jesus instructs them, man, just, just, just go ahead and put some water in it. Put some water in it. <laughs> Turned around, and the host of the party, he reaches into these pots. Now, I saw them put water. Man, listen here, king dude. I saw them put water in this thing. And this man took a cup and dipped down inside of it and pulled some wine out of it. Not only did he pull some wine out of it, he, mm, this top shelf. Why are you just not giving us this? This should have been on day one. This should have been at the very beginning. You don't save the best for last. Why? Why? Because the reason for doing that was that they had a little bit top shelf. They had a lot of the bottom shelf. I don't have to explain it to anybody, do I, what that means, right? I think we all know what top shelf and bottom shelf means, right? Okay. 
But we ain't, we ain't been saved our whole lives, okay? Let's go ahead and be honest. We ain't been saved our whole lives, okay? We know what top shelf means and we know what bottom shelf means, okay? All right. So somebody knows something about some Morgan Davis in here, right? Some MD44. Somebody knows something about that, right? Canadian Miss, you know, Crown Royal. Somebody know. Okay, just want to make sure we all on Southern Comfort, Wild Turkey. Somebody knows something about that, right? Okay, just want to make sure I wasn't in here by myself this morning, okay? We ain't been saved our whole lives, okay? So, so, so what happens is uh, they, they, they take the good and they give it to you first. Get you good and intoxicated, having fun. Then they give you the cheap stuff. Cause they got a whole lot of that, and now by this time, you don't know what you're drinking. You, <laughs> hey, I don't care if it's Boom Farm, Canadian Miss, <laughs> uh, I don't care what it is. You, you, you feeling good at this moment, at this time. But what this man says, hold on, you done brought the good stuff out at the end. So, so imagine you hearing that. And you're like, that, that had to have been a miracle. Everybody's talking about it. My son is laying here, and he's about to die. Let me go talk to this man. Maybe this man can do something for me. Maybe this man can help me in this situation. So the man gets up. The man gets up before dawn, and he arrives to Jesus around noon. So we were looking about six to eight hours. Begging, okay, for a healing. Now, mind you, Jesus puts him off. Remember I said Jesus, he, he rebuked him. In all three stories. The man's son, the man at the pool of Bethesda, and where else? The blind man. Jesus always put him off first. Or did he push his faith? Did, he, did Jesus ignore him or did he push this man's faith? Sometimes God won't, will be silent to push us to keep on believing that one day he's going to answer my prayer. Amen, amen. Sometimes God will go silent on us yeah. to see how much you really want this from me. Amen. See, we get into a microwave society sometimes where we think that, hey, I push a button and God answers them in. God said, no, son, that ain't how I work. How bad do you want this? Because, see, sometimes we do some things. I just did this not too long ago. I was praying. I was fasting. I was praying. I was fasting. And when God went silent and God didn't answer the prayer that I thought he did, I stopped doing it. And then he convicted me and said, see, that's why I didn't do it. Because I knew you didn't have the faith. You just wanted to see a sign. You was trying to manipulate me. And then I talked some, to some other pastor friends of mine. And they said, don't feel bad. We've all done it. A good friend of mine says his wife laid up there dying of cancer. And he said, Lord, if you let her heal, if you let her live, I promise you, I will stop doing what I'm doing. And guess what God did? He took her anyway. Because bottom verse that says, Lord, only a contrite heart can you use. Our hearts have to be contrite sometimes. So sometimes God wants to know how much do you want this. So Jesus pushes this man back. No, man, go on. And the man kept persisting. God wants to know, will you be persistent with him? Let me see how much faith you have. But here's the thing. Unless you see a sign, you won't believe. I need for you to take my word for it. So Jesus, the, the, the man, grabs on to Jesus and says, sir, Come with me. And Jesus like, no. So he, Jesus already pushed him away. Now he's saying, no, I am not coming down there with you. Can you accept God's answer when it's not the answer you want? 
Will you be okay or will you get mad? Will you pout? Will you get mad at God? Well, you didn't answer this the way I wanted you to. Y'all stick around for this morning's sermon. We're going to talk about that. So then Jesus makes the man move his face from his eye to his ear. So Jesus said, you, if you see a sign, you'll believe me. But I want you to hear. See, your eye, you see it, now you believe. Now I need you to take my word. I need you to hear what I'm saying. And then he says, <laughs> he says, uh, go home. Your son lives. Now this man wants Jesus to come to his house with him. Jesus says, no, I'm not coming to your house, but your son lives. Can you accept the package from God wrapped and presented differently than what you're used to? Can you? I know you. we used to certain things all the time. All the time we used to things being presented a certain way. And we start to do that with God. Lord, if you do this, if you do that, then I will do that. It doesn't work that way. God said, I need for you to do this, then I will do that. I need for you to stop looking at me for what I do with, my, with your eyes and go off of my word only. And my word says, your son lives. How would you deal with that situation? I don't want somebody to type in the comment section online, and I want to hear some answers out here in the comment. How would you handle that situation? You don't travel far to meet this man Jesus, who turned water to wine. That's the only thing that you know about. He done turned water into wine. That's the only thing you know about. And you done made a request of this man to come to your house, and he says, "No, I'm not coming to your house, but your son lives." What would you do? How would you handle that? What, what, what would you do? It's okay. You can be transparent. God knows our heart. Okay. That, that's, that's, that's a transparent moment. It's okay. What would you do, Deacon Blake? Can I be honest with you? I'll be upset. I done got up early this morning. I done traveled in this hot Middle Eastern desert. Heat. Dust everywhere. I'm coming to you. Because see, this man is a royal official. He used to call him the shot. Right. He, he used to pointing and people do things. He don't care. Hey, I need you to come to my house. My son is about to die. Now you listen. Unless you don't come to my house, he's going to die. Jesus said, you just want to see what I do. I want you to take me at my word. Take me at, that's faith. Take me at my word. Your son going to live. Now this man has to go all the way back home. This, all, this man didn't listen to me. I told him to come to my house with me. He wasn't coming to my house with me. God. Now I'm walking all the way back. Yeah. Jesus won't go with the man. And, and, and that's the most agonizing feeling to have. I mean, can, can you see the man that's heart pounding? On the door, I, I believe, but... Help my unbelief. I think we all had that moment before. Lord, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. I I, I'll take you at your word, but <clears throat> increase my faith. To, be, to, to believe your word will accomplish what you set it out to do. Now, I've read it many times that it says, Lord, your word won't go forth and come back unto you void. 
But right now, I feel like that check ain't going to happen. I got the check in my hand, but I feel like that check ain't going to be able to be deposited. I see it written out to me from you, but I, I oh, Lord have mercy, I still feel like it's not going to work. Insufficient funding. Man, could you see the man? Can, can, can you see the man? But we remember what Hebrews 11 and 6 tells us, for without faith it's impossible to please God. And this is how we operate in this day and age so many times. But God knows our hearts. He knows we're going to have a transparency moment. See, we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith and not by sight. We move on the assurance of what we do not see. Man does not live by signs or facts or eyes alone, but by what every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus just showed him, you don't need a sign. You just need a word. How many of us in here just need a word? How many of us have lived off of the word of God? I, I don't know how you're going to do it, Lord, but I believe you're going to do it. But it's okay to have a transparency moment. It's okay to sit up there and say, Lord, help my unbelief. Oh, Lord, I've been praying 40 days and 40 nights for this, and it didn't happen. Lord, you said you love me, though. Man, I sat in that house, and I cried, and I laid on the floor, and I said, Lord, fix this. And you still didn't do it the way I wanted it done. Can you live off of his word? Or do you need some signs? So, so, so here's the thing as we get ready to close. The man is walking back home. And he runs into his servant. He said, hey, man, your son lived. Huh? Now, 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 now imagine this man. He's sitting there. Probably stopping more than when he did on his way there. And he's sitting there and he's just like, man, I, I, I traveled this far, a whole day's journey to, to, to heal, to get my son healed. And this man just turned me, it's a waste of time. Man. He traveled some more. Now all of a sudden he runs into his servant. Now he can probably imagine he see his servants coming. He's thinking they're about to tell him, your son is dead. Your son has died. Your son no longer lives. And they say, hey, your son is alive. So now the man, remember, he says, Lord, help my unbelief. Increase my faith. And now he, this is where his faith is increased. He said, tell me what time it happened. They said about 1 o'clock. Man, remember, that's when Jesus told me my son lived. That's an increased faith. But guess what? The man never would have gotten to this point had he not took Jesus for his word. Sometimes the directions are not clear. Sometimes we don't get the whole picture. Stick around. Sometimes we don't get the whole picture. But what we do here, what we do receive, we got to learn how to act on it. He said, your son lived. So there was nothing else Jesus could do. The man wanted Jesus to come to his house. Jesus said, I give you a word. I, I, the man probably would have been happy and skipping and all that stuff that Jesus was walking beside him. But think about it. Servants came and said, your son had died. They ain't really feel like Jesus don't always respond in the way that he wants us to. But take him at his word. Take him at his word. And then here's the thing. Jesus still never goes to this man's house. But what ends up happening? Because this man went back and said about 1 o'clock, y'all, <laughs> Jesus told me my son was going to live. And my son lived at 1 o'clock. <laughs> hey, he ain't here right now, but y'all got to have faith to believe that when Jesus says something, when he gives us his word, he's going to do it. And guess what the Bible says? 
said, his whole household got saved. His whole household believed because his whole household didn't see Jesus, but they had faith to believe that Jesus did it. Lord, have mercy. That's what Jesus really wanted in this man more than anything. It really wasn't about the son living. Because guess what? The son got to die again one day. We see the miracle in Lazarus being pulled out of the grave. But what did Jesus say prior to? He said, Lord, not that you ain't going to hear me, because you always hear me, but for those who don't believe, Jesus is always looking for those who don't believe. It's more than pulling Lazarus out of the grave because Lazarus has to die again. This son, this man's son, has to die again. But the whole purpose was to get the family and this man saved. Sometimes we got to go through some things for a greater purpose. Sometimes the purpose is not for us. But your testimony, based off of this man's testimony, his whole household got saved. This official had to stake his faith on more just the signs and wonders, but on Jesus himself. So if your focus is not on Jesus, and you're looking for all these signs, you look, a friend of mine uh, I met uh, this weekend, he pastors in Kansas. church meeting, getting ready to vote on keeping him as pastor or not, because nobody has joined the church. They're using that to say he should not be pastor, because nobody has come in his couple of years of joining the church, nobody has come and gave their life to Jesus. How do they know that? You don't need to come down here and take a seat to give your heart to the Lord. Somebody's watching online right now. Somebody may see this video a year from now and give their life to the Lord. Who are we as a church to set up there and keep tabs up? Ain't nobody joined the church. You ain't doing a good job. We need a new pastor. That's literally what my friend is going through right now. Because they want to see signs and wonders. Jesus said, no, it ain't about the signs. It ain't about what you see, but can you take my word that the church is growing? It don't need for anybody to come down and take a seat, give the pastor their hand. That's just an outward expression anyway. Most people think that if you don't get in that water back there, you won't get saved. No, the moment you give your life to Jesus is when you're saved. You ain't got to wait on drawing no water back there and saving and, and dipping you in the water. That's an outward expression. But the real change takes place in your heart. So can you move Amen. from the signs and look it with the eye? And can you take Jesus at his word? That's the end of our Sunday school day. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Any question, comment, online, go ahead, type in the comment section for me. Any question, comments, or concerns right now? Give me some comments. Go ahead. Yeah.
Well, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not a teacher. The Holy Spirit doesn't have his own agenda. The Holy Spirit is to remind you everything that Christ has already taught you. So it says, because Christ is now no longer here physically with us, so he's not actively teaching us. So what the Holy Spirit does is pushes us back to those 66 books. What did Jesus remind us of this? Sometimes the Holy Spirit reminds you of a situation that you were in prior to and how God made a way for you. So that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of what Jesus has taught us already. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have his own agenda. To guide you. To guide yourself is to guide you back to Christ. To guide you back. So if you're, if you're going through a So when you have the troubles and the tribulations and people on your job getting on your nerves and things of that nature, then, then, then the Holy Spirit reminds you of what Christ spoke about that. Christ said they're going to hate you for my name's sake. In this world, you're going to have trials and tribulations. You're going to have some issues and some problems, but take heart. Have faith, because I've already overcome it. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, to point you back to what Christ already spoke about this situation. Whether it's good or bad. Some people don't like to wait. Some people want to tell the Holy Spirit when to come and not wait on the Holy Spirit to come on his own. Yeah, I need you to come right here, right now. You know, but that's not. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you to those that are watching on Facebook Live right now. I am so glad that you was able to join us in this space and in this place. Now, stay tuned. 25 minutes, our morning worship begins, okay? in 25 minutes and today we are starting our summer sermon series on faith okay we're going to keep on with this lesson right here but we'll go back to Genesis in the beginning I want to thank you so much for joining us right now and to those that are in the sanctuary thank you so much it is always a such an honor and a privilege for you to meet with me in this space and in this place. And as we close out today's lesson, let's close it out with prayer. Lord, we come today to say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done. We praise your holy name right now, Lord. But Lord, in those moments where we wrestle with our faith, Lord, is we know that it's okay. You said it, Lord, that we can have faith but we can also have some unbelief at the same time. So, Lord, where we are weak with our faith, we're asking you, Lord, to build us up, Lord. Build us up right now, Father. Let us know, Lord, that sometimes your work, Lord, does not always come the way that we want it to come. And we can't manipulate you. We can just be obedient, Lord. So give us that spirit of obedience, Lord. That spirit of understanding, Lord, that everything works for our good, Lord. We love you and we praise you right now. It is in the master's name of Jesus we pray. Amen.